सूर्य None of us took Surya seriously. He was a lightweight in the temple hierarchy. Even newcomers like myself considered ourselves superior. He knew the chants, yes, and he knew the traditional way of doing things, yes, and what had to be done when, what prayers, what rituals when they were mandated, yes to all of that. But he was a misshapen old lump, hobbled, wizened and ugly. forgive me but it's all true he really was all those things and despite his age he didn't seem to be held in any regard by the seniors in the temple so why would we juniors give him the time of day most ignored him some laughed at him and some outright taunted him i'd even wondered if he was deaf or mute too but he wasn't the muck that was thrown at him verbally i mean just seemed to slide off him and he went about his chores without a word or glance of reproach he was always the one sent on the tedious visits through the neighboring countryside perhaps they wanted his ugly visage out of the way or just dumped him with the vexatious jobs that no one else wanted i don't know but he'd often be seen with a small bundle of his personal belongings and a larger one of the temple's belongings limping down the road from the temple wearing his battered rubber sandals weeks later he'd come plodding back and after the briefest of pauses to wash and a longer one to present his respects to the deity he'd be seen waiting patiently to submit his accounts word had it that he never held back an extra penny even if it was gifted to him personally by the supplicants how he survived on the road was anybody's guess but no one seemed to care enough to find out he'd always have performed extra services on his sojourns and would give full details of those two never withholding what no one would otherwise have even known about scrupulously honest we laughed that he turned in all the cash because he had no notion what to do with it and there were many among us who were eager for an opportunity to show him if only he'd give us the chance i must confess i joined the gaggle at first no one had a good word to say for him and he was always given the meanest tasks and treated with barely veiled impatience if not outright impertinence but nothing ever ruffled his feathers if he could even be said to have had any feathers we sniggered when we saw temple visitors bowing before him they bowed to his age we surmised as they were probably unaware of how low in the pecking order he was he received their offering with a simple nod of his head but by and by it dawned on me that even regular visitors to the temple who should surely have known better also always bowed before him as they did to the head priest and to nobody else in fact as i began to keep an eye on the situation based i am ashamed to admit on no nobler emotion than curiosity i observed many going out of their way to approach him he was always busy though and after a quiet nod would turn his attention back to his work but there were many regulars who wouldn't leave the temple without visiting him his placid acceptance of all blows had intrigued me and i'd been looking out for him otherwise i'd never have noticed this inexplicable practice he maintained a very low profile himself always in the shadows i kept my own counsel but stayed a lot i never saw anything much He was always at his task and his silence and concentration did not encourage disturbance. Taking curiosity further, I approached him one day and asked if I may accompany him on his travels. He gazed at me in sweet surprise and then with a soft nod 
said it was okay with him if it was okay with the head priest. It took many requests before I received that second okay. But I am nothing if not stubborn. And after asking four times and being denied four times, I still requested again. And this time was granted permission, probably just to shut me up. My bundle of personal possessions was much larger than Surya's. And I wondered how basic his kit was. I'd thought mine pretty basic, yet his was half the size. We set off and I could feel the eyes of many of the residents burning into my back as I followed in his stunted footsteps. It was a long time before it dawned on me as I shifted my kit from one sweaty shoulder to the other that I carried just the one while he carried the much larger bundle of the puja utensils as well. When I shamefacedly offered to carry it, he shook his head saying he was used to it. Late is still better than never though, and I insisted. It was heavy. I grunted as I shouldered it and looked in amazement at this puny chap. How could he possibly lug this weight around? He immediately offered to take it back, but of course I couldn't permit that. Our pace slowed now that I, half his age or less and infinitely better muscled, bowed under the unaccustomed burden. As we approached the first village, I saw a posse of men, women and children come hurtling down the road. I could see they were a happy lot, not an aggressive one. Perhaps they were off to a wedding. I had my socks knocked right off when I realized it was a welcome committee for Surya. Children threw themselves around his spindly legs, threatening to knock him over. Women and men bent to touch his dust-laden feet and he dispensed his blessings and his smiles freely. Smiles? I'd never seen him smile before. I was thunderstruck, to put it mildly. I was given a few odd looks because they'd obviously never seen anyone with him before. But they accepted me generously enough. He was escorted to the village and given a comfortable seat. For my part, I was just relieved to put down that heavy bundle. We were treated as honoured guests, with me receiving some of his reflected glory. In the three days we were there, he performed many simple rituals for the residents. I assisted him in all his practices and took over all the heavy lifting and cleaning. It was back-breaking. I just couldn't understand how this broken little man had been doing all this himself. Only my pride prevented me from throwing in the towel. If he could do it, I had to be able to do it. But it wrung me out and I slept the sleep of the dead every night. While all this physical stuff was going on, my brain was trying to wrap itself around what I was experiencing. He was subdued, quiet, humble, low profile. But the people clamoured for his attention and poured out their affection for him. He accepted it with the simplest humility. He gave guidance, offered solutions for problems he could have no possible personal experience of. As a celibate priest who'd lived decades without any family except the temple fraternity, he resolved disputes because both sides respected him highly and accepted his hesitantly offered suggestions as law. He blessed the children and listened to the aged. I could only follow him and watch and listen. I declined to give my own opinion, often at variance with his, and deferred to his age and seniority. Good move, I understood only later, because I learnt more in those three days than in the previous six months at the temple. At the end of our stay, I hefted the heavy bundle onto my shoulder again, stemmed his offer by a single glance and followed doggedly behind him down the dusty road. The same scene was repeated in village after village. And in that 15 days of travel, 
my respect for the man went from zero to a hundred. They revered him. They adored him. They were honored to have him in their midst. And as I was seen as his acolyte, helping and serving him, I came in for a good bit of respect myself. You can readily comprehend that it started off embarrassing me. But soon, it caused me to burn with shame. My motives in accompanying him had been far from lofty. I'd been curious. I'd thought him a small person and ugly. And the respect they offered me made me feel small and ugly myself. It took me some time to realize that the Surya I saw on the road wasn't any different from the Surya I'd been seeing in the temple. He was just as humble, diligent, earnest, methodical. The difference was in how he was treated by others. Here he was admired and respected. At the temple he was scorned and disregarded. But he accepted both with the same equanimity. He spoke much more here because people approached him and required his help. But when they didn't, he was as silent and still as I'd always known him to be. For me, it was a growing up of sorts. I'd been a callow adolescent, but those 15 days made me a man. I accompanied him on every trip after that. And while I learned dreams, I also learned I could never hope to emulate him. So I made my decision and I've stayed with it. For the next six years, as he got older and more wizened and tougher on one level, but more fragile on another, I was his constant companion. Not just on the road, but even at the temple. Many couldn't understand my behavior. They'd thought I was destined for better things. I was summoned and questioned multiple times, but insisted that it was my personal preference and refused to elaborate further. Surya accepted my services with unspoken humility but he came to lean on me more and more. Until one day, even that support was inadequate and he continued his onward journey, leaving me suddenly and completely bereft. As word of his departure spread, the mourners started arriving. No one had expected the endless line of tearful villagers. For four days and nights they came, men, women and children, and wept at his side, touched his feet respectfully, sought and blessed me. For four days and nights, I sat beside him or slept fitfully when wrung to exhaustion. I couldn't make myself leave his side. On the fifth day, even his mortal remains were gone and nothing held me back in the temple. I'd long realized I wasn't priestly material, not the kind of priest I'd want to be if I could at any rate, the kind I'd seen so close at hand. And so, with Surya gone, I packed my small belongings and I left. 